Sri Siddhartha Gopinath Flower Festival. My special welcome to my very dear and senior god brother Shutikirti Prabhu. Yes, good wife Vishaka Saki Devi. Shutikirti Prabhu was for several years Srila Prabhupada's personal assistant traveling the world at the side of Srila Prabhupada 24 hours a day. We are very honored you have come to bless us today. This is a unique festival. Generally, public festivals are crowded with many, many thousands of people. And these days, the young people are very strong and enthusiastic. And those who used to be young <laughs> some of us long ago <laughs> Uh, are somewhere off to the sides or watching on television. <laughs> because it's just too much. <laughs> um, the crowding and the dancing and kirtans and everything. But today we find very rare. It's been many years I've seen like this right in the front some of our very senior devotees who for 30, 40 years have given their, their very lives and souls to make Sri Shirad Gopinath Temple and all of the um, affiliated projects, what they, are, what they are today and what they may be tomorrow. And whatever young people we see here are the grandchildren <laughs> of the people I'm speaking about. <laughs> Sometimes children. <clears throat> um, but we wanted, because this flower festival has been part of our tradition since perhaps 1988, I think we first started, and ever since. 92, okay. when it comes to numbers, I'm happily surrender to whatever corrections come my way. Um, 92 means 31 years, 32, 32 years. Mm -hmm. So we made a special arrangement, the leaders of Radha Gopinath Temple, that we actually wall off the temple in our own ways so that um, the very, very senior devotees could very comfortably be seated without being mutilated or crushed. <laughs> with all respects to the enthusiasm of the youth. <laughs> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in his first verse of Shikshastakam, he concludes, Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtan that the prime benediction for all humanity is this congregational chanting of God's holy names. Such a powerful statement and how Srila Prabhupada has so artfully 
and comprehensively translated the prime benediction. That means that which bestows upon all humanity of all varieties, of all nationalities, of all castes, of all creeds, of all religions, of all everything. The most valued blessing there is is that through this congregational chanting of the holy names, each and every one of us could be on the path to the highest perfection. Namo Mahabharata Nyaya Krishna Prema Padayate. A perfection that no other incarnation in the history of the world, even in the Vedic civilization, has ever given so freely. Even Radha Krishna themselves have not given this benediction of the standard of love of God, the path of such deep and complete surrender between the soul and Krishna. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, Yegata Mam Prabhadyante that according to how we surrender, how we seek shelter of the Lord, that is how Krishna will reciprocate with us. <clears throat> when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was sitting on the bank of Godavari River with Srila Ramananda Rai, they were discussing the principles from the most basic spiritual principles to the most inclusive, most intimate, ecstatic revelations of love of God. And it's very interesting. Through this whole evolution, the first question Lord Chaitanya asked Ramananda Rai, what is the essence of perfection? What is the true spiritual principle? And Ramananda Rai, he responded, and we have a tendency to just take it in a casual way and think, oh, this is all he said. He said, by carefully following the Varnashram principles by performing our duties according to this dharma, one can achieve love of Krishna. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he replied, this is external. Tell me something more. How many people in this world, how many people in India, how many devotees even are actually following this? Performing their dharma according to the Varnashram principles. Actually doing their duties, not just in theory, but in practice, to achieve love for Krishna. This is extremely rare. This idea of duty is so difficult. In previous generations, even in our own lifetime, we saw how there was certain cultivation through families and through societies of this sense of duty. Duty means there's a principle higher than our own desires our own comforts, our own convenience, even our own life that we're willing to surrender to. The Dharma family, such sacrifice. Sometimes for country, 
sometimes for their occupational, a duty that they're willing for a higher principle to endure any kind of inconvenience. This idea of dharma is sometimes translated as duty. It's a type of surrender. But Lord Chaitanya dismissed it as external. Tell me something more. And Ramananda Rai was quite amazed. <laughs> and he began to explain higher and higher levels of surrender to God, to Krishna. Not only to, to perform one's duties in devotion with knowledge of one's relationship with the Supreme Absolute Truth, Gyan, with a desire for liberation. Lord Chaitanya said, that's, li that's external. Tell me something more. Brahmabhuta prasanatmana sochati nakamshati. To actually serve the Lord, to surrender to the Lord without even a desire for liberation, but simply for Krishna's pleasure. Lord Chaitanya wanted to hear more. To abandon all duties <laughs> and just surrender to Krishna. Which actually means all of those, it doesn't mean you give up your duties, it means all those other things are included within the higher, more inclusive principle. but we're doing it simply for Krishna's pleasure. And then he takes us, you know, through, through liberation, through Vaikuntha, to the level of the surrender of the residents of Vrindavan. Anyabhilashita sunyam, Rupa Goswami describes that the quality of real devotion, pure devotion, is we have no attraction f for liberation, for material acquisition, or even for supernatural powers. Nadanamna janamna sundarim kavitam vajakadisha kami. Mama janmani janmani shwari bhavatan bhakti rohaitiki. This is still a preliminary state of cultivating the consciousness to what Vrindavan is. I do not want wealth. I do not want fame or power. I do not want any types of physical or emotional pleasures. I do not even want mystic powers or liberation from suffering forever. I only want to serve you, my Lord, in whatever condition you put me, birth after birth after birth. Who could pray like this? We say it. <laughs> but honestly, from the heart, recognizing what we're actually asking for, this is something so profound, it's so deep. This is where Lord Chaitanya begins his teachings to Sanatana Goswami. The idea of being an eternal servant of someone, do we think about what that really means? And do we really mean it? You have to really trust somebody to want to, to be willing to surrender like that. Because in this world, 
we're all trying to enjoy, we're all trying to acquire, we're, we're, we're envious of people, we're, we're depressed because of what people do, and, and, and you know, our idea is the more we get, the more we will enjoy, whether it be physical pleasures, or profit, adoration, distinction, fame. These are actually more entangling than physical pleasures because they aggravate the state of the conditioned ego even more. And in many ways, the subtler the pleasures, the more dangerous they could be on the path of pure devotion. Because we think we have power. And when we think we have power, how can we surrender as an eternal servant to the all-powerful? The promises of this world on so many different levels are actually great distractions from the path toward pure love of God because pure love of God is given to us according to how we surrender. So the beginning of the path of bhakti is shravanam kirtanam. First we hear. Why is this hearing so important? Because unless we really have faith in Krishna, unless we, when we hear Krishna's teachings, when we see his beautiful form and we hear what the nature of his beauty, his sweetness and his glory is, and we hear about the great saints and acharyas and what their lives were according to their surrender, then yes, I want to be the eternal servant of the beauty, the love, the sweetness, and the glory of Krishna. And that is why association of devotees is so important. Because we hear about how lovable Krishna is, <laughs> how supremely powerful Krishna is, and yet, how totally accessible he is through the nature of our surrender. And then we want to. And in Vrindavan, Lord Chaitanya has come to bring these beautiful pastimes of Vrindavan to us and actually giving us the path by which in this lifetime, according to the sincerity of our surrender, we can enter into the Nitya Leela, the eternal pastimes of Shishirata Gopinath. Now, giving us the path doesn't mean taking us there. But at the same time, we can't get there unless he takes us there. It's the path of giving ourselves over to his mercy. And then he takes us there. But we have to, by our own free will, give ourselves according to our own capacity to follow that path. Today, while they were um, preparing the altar and decorating Shishirata Gopinath, for some time I was just sitting on the altar and just observing. And it was so wonderful because the Pujaris, they're according to their abilities and their devotion, they're making wonderful offerings, but actually almost at every minute there's different types of flower decorations coming in. And who's making those flower decorations? 
Some were being made up here in the temple room, some were downstairs in the courtyard, some were in the side room, some were bring from homes. I don't know where they were all coming from. Someone's growing the flowers. Many, many of them were grown by our devotees. Some are shipping them and carrying them and bringing them to the temple, and some are making them into these different ornaments. Somebody's making the cloth, someone's sewing the flowers on the cloth, somebody's carrying it up into the altar, somebody's putting it. This is Sankirtan. Everyone is together making an offering. And who has the most important service? Actually, everyone is interdependent on each other. Somebody else is paying for it all. <laughs> so there's all sorts of different varieties of people contributing. And as I was seeing you know, and, and thinking about where is this coming from and who is making it, and no one is getting paid for it. No one is getting paid for giving the donations for all these things. No one is being paid for sitting and for hour after hour meticulously putting their heart and soul into preparing these wonderful clothes made out of flowers. I think even princes and queens and, and Bollywood and Hollywood stars, nobody makes flower clothes for them. <laughs> but here we're making flower clothes for them and spending days and days doing it, knowing that tomorrow they'll, they'll, never, they'll only wear it once. And then you know how flowers, they, they just, they're flowers. <laughs> it's only for one time. It's only for one darshan. And how rare it is. It's such a surrender. And how many people here know who made which flower necklace? And whoever made it knows that nobody knows. <laughs> but Radharani knows and Krishna knows. Because it's offered with love and devotion. And as I was sitting, I was remembering Shri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahi Anya. Radha and Krishna came to give themselves eternally to the people of this world through the life and teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Lord Chaitanya, he played the role of a devotee. And he knew how people in this world are so inclined toward trying to be the enjoyer. It's very hard for people to actually really come to grips the idea that I'm meant to be enjoyed. And you have to really trust somebody to do that. Just a couple days ago, someone was asking me, it seems really difficult to, to follow this philosophy wherever you look, you're thinking, I am not the enjoyer of this, or I'm not a joyer of that, and I'm not the enjoyer of him or her. Because we have a propensity to enjoy. It sounds good philosophical, but there's nice food to think I'm not the enjoyer. <laughs> Uh, um, but when that question came, 
we are remembering this verse from Bhagavad Gita. Bhoktaram yajya tapasam sarva loka maheshwaram. Suradam sarva bhutanam kyatva mam shanti mechti. Krishna is not telling us to go around and think that I am not the enjoyer. Krishna is teaching us that he is the supreme enjoyer. And we are meant to be enjoyed by him. And when we understand how Krishna is a supreme enjoyer, he's the super, we want to control. How do we give that up? Not just by negating our desire to control, to be a proprietor and to be an enjoyer, but by filling ourselves with the understanding and the faith that Krishna is the supreme controller, proprietor, and enjoyer. And then whatever we do, whatever we have, whatever we speak, if we're trying to do it for Krishna's enjoyment, that's watering the root of the tree. That analogy of watering the root of a tree is very, very um, practical. Because when you water the root of the tree, it's not that the leaves and the flowers and the branches don't enjoy. They actually enjoy. We're actually the eternal soul. Our soul actually enjoys when we, to the degree we surrender to give Krishna enjoyment. And to the degree we're separated from that, inevitably we must suffer. So many complexities in this world. So Lord Chaitanya was teaching, Krishna's God, I'm just a devotee. But to satisfy his devotees, sometimes he actually accepted their love and devotion. And this was called the Mahaprakash. He was sitting at Srivats Thakur's altar, and everybody understood what he was doing. And just like Radha Gopinath, Lord Chaitanya's Radha Gopinath, he was sitting on the altar and they were doing abhishekams and they were bringing him all sorts of food and all sorts of ornaments and all sorts of um, bathing material um, substances just to make him happy. And everyone was enjoying so much. And on the altar, the pujaris were Nityananda Prabhu, Adoita Charya, Srivas Thakur, Gadadhar Pandit. These are avatars. These are the greatest acharyas that have ever manifested in this universe. But then, where were all the gifts that they were offering coming from? There was that one simple lady. She was uneducated. She was just the assistant of a maidservant in the sense of her profession. She had no physical wealth, but she was so happy just to bring some clay pots of water from the Ganges to give to someone, to give to someone, to give to someone, to give to one of the Acharyas to offer to Lord Chaitanya. She wanted nothing else but just to, to assist those who were giving pleasure to the Lord. In other words, she had no envy. She was surrendering to the pleasure of the Lord and she was surrendering her own desire to be famous and known and, and recognized. And Lord Chaitanya was looking at her. He said, who is this person? And Srivas looked over. And actually, she was from such a poor, uneducated background in Bengal in those days. Traditionally, when somebody's really unfortunate, you name them something like Dukhi, which means miserable. 
Because if you name somebody miserable, it's like kind of a superstition that, that then people will feel sorry for you and not make you so miserable. <laughs> so he said, her name is Duki. And Lord Chaitanya said, no, I give her the name Suki, which means happy. And at that moment, he gave her ecstatic love for Krishna. He gave her the same love as all of the acharyas because she was just participating in this sankirtan in giving pleasure to the Lord. In Krishna's pastimes, we know the story of the yajna brahmins. They were performing a yajna, a big sacrifice um, of ceremony that was meant to bring about so much auspiciousness and dharma and riches and all of these things. And the husbands and the wives they were you know, doing together. Krishna sent his little cowherd boyfriends and said, they were all hungry sitting on bank of Yamuna herding cows. He said, go to them because at this time it's a really good time for them to give in charity. Tell them that we're hungry. Give us some food. They have so much food. So they went. They said to the Brahmins, oh, gods on earth, you are so learned and so great. Please Krishna and Balaram and all of us were very hungry. Give us some food. And they were thinking that their spiritual ceremonies that they were performing were so important to their families, to humanity. Why should we waste our time giving attention to these little boys who are taking care of cows? So they actually ignored them. And the boys were quite heartbroken. It's one thing to be accepted. It's one thing to be rejected. But it's even harder when people don't even acknowledge you exist. So they went back to Krishna. And they didn't recognize. Krishna said, that's all right. When you're a beggar, sometimes you get, sometimes you don't get. But go to their wives. They love me. Now these ladies, they never saw Krishna in their whole life. But when they would go to the market, you know, to get fruits or vegetables or flowers or grains, they would sometimes um, hear the residents of Brindaban coming to those markets and talking about Krishna about his beauty and his love and his pastimes. And just by hearing about Krishna, they fell in love with him. So when the little cow, her boy said, Krishna and Balaram are asking for some food, they immediately said, we'll go, we'll go. And they started getting the best of all their foods. Their husbands, their fathers, their Everybody was trying to stop them. You can't go now. You're in the middle of a very, very important activity. We'll never let you come back. They just left. Now, they were loving, responsible people. But they understood that by pleasing Krishna, everything, everything is achieved. And it's interesting because one, there, there's a beautiful description which the acharyas, um, they give more details. But the husband held her back, wouldn't let her go, physically stopped her. She stood there, but her life force, her soul, was so absorbed in remembering Krishna in separation that she was completely united in her love for Krishna. And her body 
It was alive, but it was like a dead body because her entire life force in feelings of separation, meditating on Krishna, was with Krishna. And when the other went to meet Krishna and gave him the best of foods, Krishna said, now you, sh you must all go home because you have your duties. And they were presenting to Krishna, all we want to do is please you. Let us just be in the forest. You won't even know we're here. And when the gopis are serving you and making you happy and dancing with you, we'll just, we'll just collect the Tulsi leaves. <laughs> or we'll provide for them what, what we can to serve you. This was their surrender. There was absolutely no ego. We're happy to be totally, completely, invisibly in the background. And we're willing to accept any type of karma that comes upon us. Just let us please you. Such surrender. And Krishna told him, you will please me the most by going back and just remember me and chant my holy names and worship me. It is not by physical proximity that you can achieve me. It's by surrendering with love. Now from this story, what they're saying, the total selflessness of how they were surrendering for the pleasure of Krishna. The gopis are so much more beyond that. That's why they can do what they're doing. They could dance with Krishna. The most inclusive, profound, and highest level of this selfless surrender is embodied in the gopis and in Sri Radha. We know the story. To give a moment of relief to Krishna from his headache, they're willing to go through hellish conditions. We can talk about being gopis. And we could think we're really advanced because we know what gopis say and how they dress and all of these things. But actually, it's all external, mental, unless we're, are, unless we're actually learning how to surrender in the spirit of the gopis. Because Krishna reveals himself according to how we surrender. He doesn't reveal himself according to how much we know. Or just what we do. So as everyone was um, sending up their offerings to Radha Gopinath, how wonderful. And I was in the temple this morning, and there were hundreds of people plucking flowers. Now, whenever I end this lecture, which I should end real soon, um, because you've come for the flower festival. But all these flower petals are going to be offered to Radha Gopinath. And then Radha Gopinath, out of their mercy, they reciprocate by giving all the flower petals back to us. But we offer them as an act of surrender, and Krishna offers it back as Mahaprasad, his grace, his mercy. Every single flower petal that was plucked, according to the, the feeling of surrender to the 
to the pleasure of God, that flower petal is more valuable than the spaceship that was just sent to the moon. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that's not important, but I am saying the flower petal is worth more. <laughs> of course, if you offer the spaceship with love and devotion, then, the, <laughs> then it could become equal to the flower petal. <laughs> But from a spiritual perspective, the value is our surrender. And what does surrender mean? It means to love, to actually love, to give of ourselves. Because Krishna is all attractive. Because we love Krishna. Or because we're on the path to love Krishna. My beloved brother, Shutakirti Prabhu, his story is so much um, a magnification of this idea. In 1972, Srila Prabhupada came to a community to give what he declared to be Bhagavad Dharma discourses. He was going to speak seven days on the teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam. And at the conclusion, he was going to be with devotees to celebrate Janmashtami. And on the next day, he was going to be personally present for his own Vyas Puja. So a lot of devotees were coming from a lot of places to be a part of this. And there were so many people preparing, and, 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 and there was, uh, on top of a mountain, very scenic, there were hundreds and hundreds of devotees going for the kirtans, and all very senior leaders of our society were there to honor Srila Prabhupada and lead kirtans, and it was such a joyful festival. Shruti Kirti Prabhu was in charge of cooking for all the devotees. He never got to go to a single lecture. He never attended a single kirtan. He never even saw Srila Prabhupada. And in those days, cooking, it wasn't, you know, in a nice marble kitchen. <laughs> They used to call the kitchen the pits. <laughs> because it was wood. And because everyone wanted to see Prabhupada, they, you know, they usually you know, just picked up any tree because we weren't allowed to cut down trees if they were alive. They had to already be dead. And unless they've been dead for a really long time, the wood is wet and it's smoke. So he's there cooking with all smoke and wood and, and, and there was no hot water. Washing the pots was like scrubbing with rocks and getting black and he was doing while everyone was enjoying the festival for two weeks. And now Prabhupada's leaving. And he's kind of <laughs> surrendered. <laughs> he was just surrendering. He wasn't cooking directly for Srila Prabhupada, were you? You were cooking for all the devotees. And he was thinking, I never even got to see him or hear him. or I was just been in this kitchen day and night. And now Prabhupada's leaving. And someone came in the door and said, Shruti Kirti Prabhu, you're going with Srila Prabhupada to be his personal cook and his personal assistant. <laughs> and then he traveled around the world with Srila Prabhupada for about three years, yes? Something? He tells the story millions of times better than me because <laughs> it's, but somehow or other I'm up here. And... But it's... 
because he was surrendered. Krishna, in his heart, was so satisfied with that surrender that he gave such a beautiful service. And Srila Prabhupada, Krishna's representative, reciprocated. So this flower festival, it's, we can, we can celebrate it with joy and flowers. But actually at the heart of it, it's a celebration of surrender. But actually in the context of bhakti, in the context of brindaban, there is nothing more joyful and festive than surrender. No one's envious, no one's materially competing. Everyone is simply happy to do the best they can to be a part of a community that's giving pleasure to Shri Radha Gopinath. So as we're seeing the flowers, the flower shower, this should be our meditation, the joy that so many hundreds of people have come together and Krishna's accepting our offerings. And even if you didn't pluck a single petal, <laughs> if you're just appreciating those people who did, you get the same benefit as plucking them all. <laughs> That's bhakti. to appreciate another person's service, to appreciate how Krishna is enjoying. He doesn't enjoy flowers. He enjoys love. But patram pushpam palam toyam, he makes love so accessible. It's just a matter of the sincerity of our heart. If you offer even a leaf, a fruit, a flower or a little water doesn't even have to be bottled water. <laughs> if we just offer some water with love and devotion, the best we can give, that's surrender. Krishna accepts it. And param vijayate Sri Krishna sankirtanam. At the very heart of all of our celebrations and all of our pujas and all of our offerings is the chanting of the holy names. Every mantra is like a flower. Every word in the mantra, every name of God in the mantra is like a petal on the flower. And when we're all chanting together, hundreds and hundreds of devotees, especially the really old devotees, uh, <laughs> when we're chanting with great enthusiasm and surrender and appreciating each other's offering as a family, family in bhakti means we're united in this spirit of pleasing Krishna, then it's a, it's a flower festival. Thank you very much. Shruti Kirti Prabhu, would you like to give some words of blessings to everyone before we begin the flower? Hare Krishna. <laughs> Maharaj, is, you know, he, he's always very truthful, except for when he speaks about me. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada in New Vrindavan, it was the one temple he called us the inmates of New Vrindavan. You all know what an inmate is. So I was an inmate in New Vrindavan. 
Um, I was thinking of one little, one little story with Prabhupada. I was, he said I was with him a long time. And um, I never had, somehow or other, had a lot of mercy from Srila Prabhupada. But I never had any devotion. And I would see all the devotees, just like Maharaj, so happy whenever they would see Srila Prabhupada. And I was with them 24 hours a day. So one time we came into Los Angeles. This was back in 1973. I had been with them for a year. And I was feeling very, very um, sorry for myself because I wasn't happy. And we know devotional services, Mara said, you're very happy. And when Prabhupada came into the gate, there were hundreds of devotees there and banging, playing the murdangas, playing the cartels. And as Prabhupada came in, big smile on his face as he saw all of his disciples chanting and dancing. And somehow or other, he always managed to look at everyone. Everyone said he looked right at me. Everyone would say that all the time, and I felt so happy. But I was right behind him, and I just felt not happy. <laughs> and we walked through the airport. The devotees are dancing and crying and laughing. And we got to Srila Prabhupada's quarters at New Dwarka Temple. And I carried his bags. I put everything away. And Srila Prabhupada was giving him his massage just before lunch. So we're both in our gumshas, Prabhupada sitting on a straw mat like this. And I was behind him. And <laughs> I, I, I thought, I just wanted him somehow or other to comfort me. And I never spoke to Srila Prabhupada. He said, you never start a conversation with your spiritual master. If he doesn't initiate a conversation, you don't say anything. And I was always like that. But I was feeling so low, and I was massaging his back, so I'm behind him. And I said, all the devotees, Prabhupada, they have so much love for you. I said, but I don't feel anything. And uh, he didn't say anything. So I didn't think I could feel any worse, but I did. <laughs> because he didn't say anything. Looking back, I can't imagine how I ever said it. I said, I have no love. And then after massage, I had so many things to do as his servant. He went in, left his oil footprints on the floor, walking into the bathroom in his gumsha. He would <laughs> and I had to run into the kitchen and start processing the cooker, cooking subjis, making chances, rolling out the japatis. I had to put all the clothes on his bed, put down the copen. I would lay the copen down, put his dhoti across the bed, put his kurta. I would button two bottom buttons on the kurta, so we only had two more to button. Then I would go to his sitting room and open up the compact mirrors, so when he put t lock on, the mirror was there. Put the little spoon in the um, lota, with the water, set everything up. And Prabhupada would come in, put on his tea lock, and then he would chant Noon Gayatri, sitting very straight. And I'm running around getting everything ready for his lunch. So then I served him his lunch, running back and forth, one japati at a time. He's sitting on the floor again, sitting on the floor, very simple, honoring prasadam. Every time I come in, I offer obeisances, slide the japati on his plate, run back out, roll another japati, come back in, slide it on his plate, offer obeisances, run back out until he goes. 
still hasn't said one word to me. <laughs> Not even looking at me. So then that was done, and after that, Prabhupada would take a nap. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So now I've done so much service, I'm sitting in my room, and I hear the bell ring. That was, that was the only instruction I received when I became his servant. When he rings the bell, you go in the room. So he rang the bell, I went in the room, I offer obeisances. And I sat up, and he looked at me. He said, do you like your service? I said, yes, Prabhupada, <laughs> very much. He said, service is love. He said, all the devotees, they can jump up and down and dance and sing. He said, but service is love. He said, just do your service. Everything will be all right. So that was 50 years ago. I still don't have any, any love. But I just keep doing service. Because one day, somehow or other, I'll be like Maharaj, sitting before the deity with great affection and love. So whatever our situation is, just keep doing your service. Because service is love. Okay. So you do that. That's my offering. If I can give any blessings to anyone, just continue in your service. Everyone here does so much nice service, just like the devotees here have done so much wonderful service for the deities. Somehow or other, now I'm in Srila Prabhupada's home, and I know that's the place for me to be in his home. The last four years in his home, still trying to do a little something, but at least I know I'm in Prabhupada's home, whatever unfortunate son I might be, I came back home to Vrindavan to be with Srila Prabhupada. So thank you, Maharaj, for allowing me to be here this evening, everyone. I think I need all your blessings and prayers and support so I can continue my service. Hare Krishna.